It's easy to think that Europe was so successful in taking over the world because they had like better ships or guns or whatever. But when you actually look at the whole story, you see that it was actually just a perfect storm of technology and timing and ideology and religion of a few key inventions. And what I wanna show you in this video is that one of the biggest reasons that Europe was able to take over the world is because of the invention of the modern corporation. A collection of people who don't know each other, but who pool their money together for the same goal, extracting resources from faraway places. So this is part two of how Europe stole the world. Hey, before we dive into this story fully, I need to tell you about the sponsor of today's video who made this video possible, which is Policy Genius. Policy Genius helps you get life insurance. Kind of a topic that none of us want to talk about, but it's a topic we should talk about because life insurance is very important. True story, I was doing a Policy Genius sponsorship last year and in the middle of the sponsorship realized, wait, I need life insurance. And I literally went to my own link and signed up for life insurance for me and my wife. It's a true story. Getting life insurance used to be kind of hard, but Policy Genius has modernized this process by making it easy to browse lots of different plans from lots of different insurance companies. They have no incentive to recommend one more than the other. They literally just take your information, make it super easy for you to see the plans available to you. Like seriously, this was a really easy process. I didn't have to go into some doctor's office. I didn't have to do anything. I literally filled out a bunch of stuff, talked to someone on the phone, and before you know it, I'm seeing the different plans and I'm being explained how they work. The thing that convinced me the most, I think, was that life insurance is way cheaper when you're young. And and so now is kind of the time to do it, to like lock yourself into a good policy at a good price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at $17 a month, and that's for like a half a million dollars of coverage. There's no weird fees, and they're not like gonna go sell your information. I mean, there's a reason why they literally have thousands of five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google. No one wants to talk about needing to use life insurance, but your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. To start comparing quotes and simplify insurance buying, go to policygenius.com slash Johnny Harris. Link is also in the description. Thank you, Policy Genius, for supporting this video. Let's dive back into how Europe stole the world. Okay, quick catch up on where we are in the story. In part one, we talked about how Spain and Portugal went out to get in on trade and accidentally ran into a bunch of land they decided was unclaimed, and it turned into a big race to see who could take over as much land as possible. After about a century of this, other Europeans start to take notice of this model of expansion and they realize that it's a great way to enrich your country. Some of these countries have been dabbling in imperialism, but in the early 1600s, it was time to get serious. The first to follow suit were the Dutch, who were becoming really good at navigating water and making maps and doing business. They decided to follow Portugal's lead and go around the bottom of Africa, stopping right here at the very tip in what today is known as Cape Town, South Africa. They established a permanent colony of white settlers whose descendants would go on to become a major part part of South Africa's history. The Dutch used their prime position in Cape Town to restock on their way to Southeast Asia, where they were trading for spices with local empires and claiming serious amounts of land in what is today Indonesia. Around the same time, at the start of the 1600s, we see the next kingdoms trying their hand at large-scale imperialism. Meet the two rookies on the block. England and France, who would go on to actually cause a lot of trouble on the world map, but for now they're just getting started. They, for the most part, followed Spain's lead, going west for the Americas, though England sent ships east at this time as well. Anyway, here in the Americas, they showed up and, like colonizers before them, found lots of land and lots of people living on that land. Hmm, kind of inconvenient. These aren't real people, right? They don't actually own this land. You can hear the English people, like, sort of saying to themselves. So they came up with a new very useful tool. It was a mental tool. In addition to guns and smallpox and alliances with local tribes that helped them divide and conquer the locals, Europeans also developed a complex set of legal philosophies to convince themselves that these people were not in fact capable to claim any land. After all, they were foragers. They didn't farm. They couldn't own this land because they didn't use it for productive means. They were subhuman, or at least non-civilized, so they do not deserve to own property. Very clever, very effective. 
so now you see the next layer of ideological thinking that was required for these Europeans to justify their land theft. It was the need to dehumanize the people living on these lands. Here's a letter from a British settler who describes North America as a wilderness, quote, where none inhabit but hellish fiends and brutish men. This dehumanizing paired really well with another ideology that was very popular at the time, Christianity. A religion that told its followers to go out and preach to everyone so that they can be saved. Perfect. We have these unrefined, brutish, fiendish men, and we have Christians who have the power to save them. Anything is possible now. So by the late 1600s, the colonizing project is fully underway. A lot of Europeans are getting in on this, but here are the major players. You've got Spain and Portugal, the OGs, and then you've got the Netherlands, France, and England. We need to make one thing clear, that the major reason why these European empires were so successful so quickly was because they were really the first to start trading by sea in the Western Hemisphere. So while Jesus and saving and whatever was a big part of the justification of Europeans going out and feeling entitled to take land, he became less and less of a part of the picture. Especially for the Dutch, who basically were just like, who cares about Jesus? We want profit. <laughs> And this is the next phase of the story of how Europe took over the world. We'll call this chapter Private Empire. And frankly, it's one of the most important things to know about this history. Remember that European imperialism started as a desire for trade, to trade with big empires in the East. Then surprise, we found all this land, we'll call it unclaimed and we'll start claiming it while dehumanizing the natives in the process, remember, okay? A lot of that was funded by governments, like kings and stuff. But eventually the citizens themselves of these places realized that they could make a business out of this. And again, this is where the Dutch wrote the blueprint. So now, instead of asking the ruler for support, they could just get together a bunch of people and form a corporation, like the first corporation ever, the Dutch East India Company, which would fund private voyages. And you, a random Dutch person in the 1600s, could buy this share, a little portion of that company, to get in on a little bit of the profits. But if the profits are big enough, then everyone wins. Welcome to the era of corporations. So now you have the Dutch with their new Kickstarter campaign, crowdfunding their private empire, totally exceeding their goal. And these Dutch corporate sailors set out on the tried and true routes that they already knew, arriving to Indonesia where they showed up, not to convert people to Jesus necessarily, but to harvest cloves and peppers as efficiently as possible and to come home and to sell them for a profit and fatten the pockets of the shareholders who funded the whole journey. This isn't like a surprising novel model to us today because this is how the world runs. Runs. But at this point, this was a new invention. Oh, and the government secretly loved this. They could give the company some military power, kind of ignore the details of exactly how it was all going down, and still ensure that their country got in on the world's riches. And these corporations leveled up really quickly and became basically little private empires with the ability to take over land, build bases, and establish relationships with locals, not for the prestige of like a king, but so that they could make more money for their shareholders. It was the private investors who helped them get really big, really fast, all through this invention of the publicly traded company. And again, it all started with the Dutch East India Company. And just like any startup, they were more nimble than the clunky old government. They had good funding, they were private, they were fast, they had an ability to undercut competition. All of this allowed them to dominate this region when it came to taking over land, harvesting stuff, and bringing it back to Europe. And because they were the best operators, they eventually became the kingpins of all spice trade in Europe. Things like black pepper, nutmeg, cloves, all of this because of the countless trips that they were taking between the East Indies and Amsterdam. Okay, but it wasn't just the Dutch. The British also got in on this private empire idea. Let's see here, this map. It's the map of all of the British private companies and their spheres of influence. The government doesn't own these places. This is like government supported, but by and large, private companies. Profit seeking businessmen looking for stuff that they couldn't get in their own country, going out and finding places where they could. 
Over here in North America, you have the Virginia Company, who's like going hardcore on tobacco, and then its sister company, the Plymouth Company. One was funded by a bunch of Londoners, and the other, the Plymouth Company, funded by a bunch of rich dudes in Plymouth, England. Their job was to colonize land and to build a business in the New World. And then, if you look over here in the East, you see the British East India Company, who got really good at taking over giant amounts of land in India. The French were doing the same thing. They had their own West India Company that was colonizing the Caribbean to grow and sell sugar. And many, many more. Private empire was such a powerful accelerant to imperialism because it got all of these private empires to compete with each other and to get better and more efficient and to practice their conquests, repetition, fueled by profit-seeking people. They developed amazing skills and they drew maps. A lot of beautiful, beautiful maps. As a map nerd, this is where I start to like perk up. I notice around this time, like sort of late 1600s and then the 1700s, European maps start to fill out with more detail, with more accuracy. Because after all, the more you can depict on paper, the better blueprint you have to conquer land and exploit it. So by the 1700s, Europe is now a different world than what you saw in the 1400s. You start to see kings living in insane excess. Tea and coffee and chocolate and tobacco and sugar. They have access to so much stuff. And perhaps most significantly, it wasn't just for the ultra rich, it was a new middle class. The mercantile class of merchants who were getting rich off of all of this new commerce. There was suddenly abundance. And with abundance comes time. Time to sit around and think about art and science, all while sipping on coffee harvested from faraway lands, stimulating these European brains to invent new ways of measuring things, to observe the world, the stars, to manipulate nature to make life better. And the competition between these private empires just grew. And like with any profit-seeking competition, these companies needed to keep leveling up how much wealth they could extract from these places, how much land they could take over to meet demand back home until eventually they turned full on to the most horrific version of profit-seeking imperialism. Stealing millions of people from most notably here in West Africa, taking them to their new colonies and forcing them to work. Stealing and trading humans and forcing them to work was not anything new to this continent. Islamic and African slave traders have been doing this for a very long time. But it was here in the 1700s, in this context of private empire, that things really start to pick up. As these European empires, mostly England, Portugal, and France, took it to a new level to fuel their highly optimized, shareholder-fueled private empires. So optimized that the slave trade itself was outsourced to a private company, at least in the case of England. It was imperial profit-seeking efficiency at its finest, and most horrifying. You can almost hear the glee and greed in the voice of one English slave trader who wrote, quote, what a glorious and advantageous trade this is. It is the hinge on which all the trade of this globe moves. But Europeans are starting to become really enlightened at this point, right? Like they're starting to think through like human rights and like equality and starting to lay the groundwork for like democracy. Yes, but remember that these Europeans had ideas in their minds that were planted hundreds of years earlier. Ideas that allowed them to invent things like the new world and unclaimed land that actually belonged to them. They applied a lot of those same ideas to the slave trade. A lack of Jesus, a lack of white European culture and technology, making these people inferior, in need of saviors to make use of their land, their resources, and their bodies. Okay, but let's just be clear about what's happening here. Yes, this is about profit. Yes, this is about ideology. But this part is so damn important to me because this is the foundation upon which our modern world is built. In this moment, these empires were actually building structures in our minds. Structures that define who has power, who is worth something, who gets resources, who is permitted to lead, to exploit, to benefit. These structures were defined by force, by profit, by greed, 
and they totally worked. They put Europeans on top, giving them the prosperity and resources to fuel scientific, cultural, and political revolutions that allowed them to keep holding on to that power, to keep exerting domination over others. Okay, yeah, I get it. Half of you just had like a conniption because of this like woke sermon that you just got from me. That's not what this is, okay? I'm trying to look at the history and tie it to today, how all of us, live in a world that was built off of what happened during this time, the ideas, the movement of people that happened because of this private empire. That's not the woke mob, that's just like, what happened? Sorry. Even after the British people here on the East Coast of North America wanted to break away from England and start their own country where, quote, all men are created equal, they still couldn't throw off the thirst for profits that slavery brought them. These structures were way too firm, so they kept doing it. The momentum of private empire was too great to slow down. At least, not without a bloody war that almost ripped this young nation apart. So, that's private empire. A huge part of Europe's ability to take over land on the map and reshape the world. In part three of this series, which is gonna be the final part, I'm gonna tell you what happens next when these powers reach every part of the globe, establishing an order that they control. How we talk, how we do our politics, how we trade, including some really good positive things that have made the world better. It's an order that was shaped by these forces of European imperialism. And it's an order that still shapes all of us today.